Professor Adesami has been with us for about a year now, and it is time for him to say goodbye. So he's going to speak to us on a topic: who owns who owns the problem? And we believe it's going to be exciting. To chair the ceremony is none other than the director of the Institute of African Studies, Professor Akosu Adumako Ampofu. She's already seated. I'm going to ask her to come over and uh, give us a few remarks before we hear the lecture. Shall we welcome her? So I've been asked to make some preliminary remarks and then I will introduce our speaker this afternoon to us with a great deal of um, pleasure. Africa is not a country. And this, is, this is something that resonates with us and our, our speaker indeed has a book that has a title that's similar to that. And yet our realities and our histories and our independence struggles and our slavery experience and colonialism and world economic order and conflicts and disease and pop culture and the foods that we eat create a certain sharedness so that even though Africa is not a country there are many things that sufficiently bring us together to allow us to essentialize in a strategic way and strategic essentialism is a, a term that an Indian feminist scholar has used so that even though you know you don't want to be essentialized, there are ways in which you do it strategically uh, for a purpose. And I think that this is something that our speaker this afternoon can be very sympathetic to. Our knowledge systems, what we decide is worth knowing and sharing, and how we arrive at these knowledge systems is also important for us as Africans and as Africanists. And this is a charge that Kwame Nkrumah gave to this institute when we were set up, that we should study Africa in African-centered ways, the peoples and cultures of Africa in African-centered ways, suggesting that there are ways of studying our lives that are African, our oral histories, our memories, our tales, and so forth. And hence, the name Africa, the continent, and the naming that we do, and, the, and, and by definition, certain extensions of our problems that we share. And it becomes a very powerful potion. Sometimes it, become, it can become a, a poison. I should just like to say a few other things, because this afternoon's talk is what? Hashtag who owns the problem. Hashtag and hashtags have become a very fashionable thing of the moment. A few years ago, there were movements to free Nigerian women who had been stoned to death. Actually, this afternoon, I heard that somebody had just been, a woman had been stoned to death in Pakistan three months pregnant because her family were not happy with the choice of person that she had selected to live the rest of her life with. And Amin Alawal was a very famous case because she also had been sentenced under Sharia law to be stoned to death. And the feminist movement on the continent and the diaspora, white feminists, black feminists, brown feminists, Asian feminists gathered. And there were huge movements and all kinds of appeals and petitions. And at one point, the organization called Women Living Under Muslim Law in Nigeria said, you know, you guys out there, uh, time out. Can you give us some space? to deal with some of these issues in Nigeria ourselves because uh, there's a way in which you are muddying the waters and President Obasanjo is not happy with all the press coverage that he's getting. So one of the things that our speaker is going to address is leaving Africans to deal with their own problems. Africans, should we? Mustn't we? At what point is the world out there also morally obligated to join us in this struggle? The current movement, Free Our Girls, has taken on a life of its own. 
and the hashtag syndrome is multiplying in leaps and bounds even as people are pleading that we do not want to see another Ameri American incursion on our continent. And these are the issues that our speaker is going to address this afternoon. I suppose helping us to meander that fine line between where we should be left alone and where we shouldn't. Let me tell you a few things about our speaker. If you see the sheaf of papers that I have here, you will be scared that it's longer than the lecture itself. So I'm just going to give you some snippets because he's a very interesting um, person and I have enjoyed having him be with us at the Institute for um, the past year. Our speaker's name is Professor Pius Adasemi. He's an award-winning writer, activist, and academician. He is the son of Isangu Yagba, the LGO of Koji State, Nigeria. He holds a first-class honors degree in French and Francophone studies from the University of Ilorin, 1992. He subsequently obtained a master's degree in French from the University of Ibadan in 1997 and a PhD in French from the University of British Columbia in 2001. He's currently a full professor at Carlton University. You can see that he's a young man. He has attained this uh, much earlier than many of us. And before that, he was an assistant professor of comparative literature at the Pennsylvania State University, Penn State and State College. Incidentally, we were there at the same time, but our paths did not cross. Fate being so kind to us, he ended up here um, eventually anyway. Professor Adesami has done many things. One of the most important, I think, uh, recently is that he won the inaugural Penguin Prize for African Writing. Uh, this was awarded in Johannesburg, South Africa in 2010 or 2011? 2011. For his book, You Are Not a Country, Africa. He's a nationally syndicated columnist who, when he was being introduced at another function in Canada by the um, High Commissioner for Nigeria in Canada noted that he makes a lot of trouble for Nigeria. He is not silent about the issues that concern his country and he's not afraid to name names and to call things as they are. The High Commissioner said something about him and I will quote. Professor Adesami has distinguished himself as an original and profound thinker who has the rare gift of articulating his ideas forcefully with extraordinary clarity and sophistication. He is indeed a trailblazer who has opened new investigative paths into the complex and evolving field of Africana studies. People wonder what is a professor of French doing talking about the issue that we have this evening. But you will soon find out and you will discover that he is as fascinating as others have found him to be and I hope that we will have an extremely lively discussion. Thank you very much, Prof. Sami. Your audience, we're really looking forward to what it is that you have. To, and as you can probably tell, he is very, very present in the social media world. YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, everything. Okay, he says, so Google his name and you will find him. You're welcome. I am told, um, Mavis tells me that I have about 40, 45 minutes for, for this talk. And I agreed. What it, I did not um, tell her and what I did not agree to is um, to set a time limit on the time I'm going to take uh, because this is a valedictory and there are so many people in this room that I won't um, who have made my stay you know and I won't get the chance to thank them or acknowledge them again if I don't do it now um, so I I didn't tell her that I was going to take some extra time uh, um, and normally, if I wanted to do it the, the Nigerian way, I run through the first 100 names on my list with all their titles. And then, 
for the next hundred names, I'll just say all protocols observed. <laughs> that will cover the 200 names on my list. But I'm not going to do it that way uh, today. I'm going to try to name a lot of names, starting with um, this country, Ghana. I guess that's where the, the thanks, the gratitude um, needs to, to start. Uh, I'm very, very grateful uh, to this country for a, a number of reasons. Uh, first is the fact that I wasn't even coming here. I was not coming here at all. I was on my way to Johannesburg, South Africa, where I had um, secured um, a visiting professorship at the University of Johannesburg. But um, I was playing hardball. We, were at, we had negotiated with the Dean of Arts there, and everything was set. But I was still reluctant, playing hardball with him. And then a brother of mine went to inspect some Carnegie projects in Johannesburg, the, uh, Professor Tadia, you know, who is in charge of um, Carnegie funding for universities in Africa. And the dean there called him and said, look, uh, there's this countryman of yours. Uh, we're expecting him here. We've never had him, but he's playing very hard. But do you know him? Talk to him. Tell him to come. And when he heard my name, he went to his hotel room and called me and said, oh, so you have a year free and you planning to come to South Africa. Don't you know how many projects I'm funding under Carnegie at the University of Ghana? You are going to Ghana. <laughs> So, <laughs> so the guy who was asked to persuade me to come to Johannesburg actually betrayed them <laughs> and said, you, you're go you are going to UG Ghana, you know. So, uh, and that's how I, I ended up here. But um, you do know that there's a lot of the sibling rivalry between, between Ghana and Nigeria. You know how it works out, you know how it plays out and all that. So it's, it's something that consists in trading and counter-trading of stereotypes and counter-stereotypes. So when I announced in the community back there in Ottawa that um, I was now headed to Accra, I'm, you know, I'd, I'd cancelled on South Africa, I'm going to Ghana. <laughs> Ghana? Ah, they don't like us there. <laughs> Everything here in the Nigerian community. But I'm thankful to Ghana because um, when I got to the airport here, you know, the immigration officer who stamped my passport, uh, as soon as I presented it, he just looked at it and said, Welcome home. And I thought he had made a mistake. <laughs> So I said, uh, uh, Oga, that's a Nigerian passport. I said, a Ghanaian passport. You know me, I said, he said, well, Ghana, Nigeria, you're home. Oh, wow. He had no idea what he had done. And that way he set the tone of um, my encounter. So welcome home. That was the first thing I heard from a Ghanaian when I stepped into this country. And it's been that way ever since. In fact, the home factor nearly got me into trouble. <laughs> nearly got me into trouble back with the family in, uh, uh, in Ottawa because the way director and the, the entire team, this marvelous institute, the way, you know, the, my insertion, my integration, the relationship with everybody, starting with the director, uh, Mavis, Joyce, the team in the office, Moses, Eddie, you know, Auntie Essie, she's not here, Professor Gordon, uh, Dr. Kwame, you know, it, it's just been home. The institute has been home. So much so that when Madame asked me back in Ottawa, so how are you, what's going on? And, and I said, oh, it's just like home. She said, ah, it's home. Okay, stay there now. <laughs> <laughs> so I quickly, I, I, I did damage control. You know, it is home, this place also. So I, 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 I really want to thank everybody, you know, uh, who, who has contributed to making my, my stay here a memorable and an unforgettable one. I, I, I will always come back now, you know. I will always come back now because this place is, is home. And I'm glad to see, because we're talking about problems today, 
and how to solve them in Africa. So I'm very happy to see the future generation of problem solvers here. And since I'm talking hashtag and social media and stuff like that and texting and all their language, so I probably should be facing this side of the room more than this side, <laughs> more than this side. I guess those who are more connected. How many of you are on social media? How many of you? Don't, all of you, I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now I can say all protocols observed and get into my into my uh, lecture. So the the title is um, hashtag who owns the problem. Esteemed colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. You must forgive me for the peculiar title of this lecture. I settled on eight weeks ago when I received an invitation to deliver a keynote address at the fourth annual African Unity for Renaissance Conference, organized by the Africa Institute of South Africa and the Tabu Mbeki African Leadership Institute, among other sponsors and co-sponsors. I have only just returned from the said conference in Pretoria. It was a great personal experience for me, sharing the stage with former South African President Abu Mbeki and listening to him grapple with the theme of the conference, the quest for African solutions to African problems. The organizers of the conference had given me a clear, unambiguous mandate about what they, wanted, what they wanted me to do. Share my thoughts on the subject of finding African solutions for African problems. From its origin in AU crisis and conflict to register roughly two decades ago, the expression morphed into the world of neoliberal institutions in the global north before making its way into the Africanist disciplines. But the conference folks in Pretoria wanted more than just um, African solutions to African problems for me. Specifically, they wanted me to engage that conference theme from the perspective of culture. In other words, how can African culture solve African problems? Let me quickly state that the singular culture is not my making. That's how it appeared in my letter of invitation. Coming from a disciplinary background where the producer of knowledge must constantly watch out for traffic cops eager to hand out tickets for the offenses of monolithization and essentialism, I probably wouldn't have dared to speak of an African culture in the singular purporting to solve African problems in the plural. However, not even the most audacious enforcers of conformity in all the humanistic and artistic disciplines with which we engage Africa would dare to hand out a traffic ticket to the scholar who drags the hashtag into the arena of serious scholarly reflection on the unending dilemmas of the African condition in the 21st century. These indeed are good times to be a hashtag. In my second life, I prefer to come back not as a bird or a flower, as is the wind of literal novels, but as the world's most recognizable symbol, the hashtag, previously only known to Americans and the English as the pound key on their phones, but catapulted to planetary celebrity status in a little under a decade by Twitter. The hashtag is the only subject that can legitimately claim to be more famous now than Kimye, that conjugal combination of Kim Kardashian and Kanye West. Indeed, it is not an exaggeration to describe the hashtag 
hashtag as the highest stage of globalization, what with its ability to go viral within seconds, crisscross geographical borders and ideological boundaries, connect cultures and peoples in defiance of difference, break down walls between causes, and create a common village square for actors as far apart as gay rights activists of the global north and anti-gay cultural fundamentalists of the global south in Nigeria and Uganda, animal rights activists in Scandinavia and the whale and shark hunters of Japan, gender rights activists in the global north and the bearded guys preventing women from driving in parts of the Arab world. Every time I reflect on this singular capacity of the hashtag to unite the world's largest community of strange bedfellows, I'm always tempted to conclude that more than three decades of intense theorizing in the humanities and the social sciences have been reduced to a tiny symbol. The intellection which yielded world system theory, globalization, and everything in between, and gave us illustrious transdisciplinary thinkers of global flows, fluxes, and borderlessness, such as Ashil Mbembe, Mahmoud Mandani, Paul T. and Bezeleza, Adibai Olukushi, Tandika Nkanda Wuri, Ato Kwesin, Emmanuel Wallerstein, Frederick Jameson, Edward Said, Ajana Padua, Gloria and Saudia, and so many usual suspects in the arena of contemporary global thought, now it boils down to the performative power of just one symbol, the hashtag. The hashtag is world system, borderlessness, and globalization on steroids. Some of you are already probably thinking that you know the reason why a Nigerian public intellectual would start an exercise such as this by singing the only key of the hashtag. Folks, don't blame me. My country, already a famous subject of all kinds of fear and unfair stereotyping here in Africa and the rest of the world, has seen her notoriety attain stratospheric heights courtesy of the hashtag. Doubtless, some of you have participated in what may now rightfully be termed the global hashtag movement. Perhaps some of you will take selfies in the course of this validated lecture, brandishing a cardboard on which you would have inscribed the winning marker of collective global activism, hashtag bring back our girls. <laughs> I'm surprised I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> The phenomenal career of this particular hashtag, Bring Back Our Girls, has very obvious theoretical implications for those who have been thinking and theorizing the borderlessness of our post-colonial and postmodern world and the modes of Africa's insertion into it in the last three decades or so. But more importantly, I suggested to my audience in South Africa, as I'm suggesting here to you today, that um, those of us who are called upon to think and write Africa and zoom in on the possessive adjective, our, map its trajectory and modes of articulation, listen intently to its politics in order to determine who is speaking, or more appropriately, who has acquired the agency to speak. In essence, every conscientious Africanist must ask the question, who is the hour in bring back our girls? I don't know the answer, but how you, est how you esteemed colleagues, answer this phony question will have very serious implications for how we continue to reflect on and engage issues of African agency after this sad episode in Nigeria. For when I received my letter of invitation to South Africa and saw the theme of the conference, African Solutions for African Problems, and the writer stating that more than a hundred scholars from Africa, Europe, and North America would gather in Pretoria to find, quote, African solutions, uh, unquote, to whatever conference participants eventually agreed, uh, quote, African problems. My mind immediately went to bring back our girls and even the Joseph Kune campaign before it. And I asked myself, who is the problem? 
or more appropriately, when was the last time Africa possessed the critical agency to own problems that are defined and narrativized as African? What are the possibilities of localizing the ownership of problems in the age of the hashtag? To make the inevitable allusion to Gayatri Spivak, and the director already brought her in this evening, can the subaltern own her problems? Some of you may have noticed that no sooner had they bring back our, head, our girl's hand gone viral than conflict over its origin and ownership arose, with CNN and the Wall Street Journal devoting time and space to clearing the air. And this war over ownership and narrative reached even as the girls were still in captivity. Who started it? Is it an offshoot of President Goodluck Jonathan's Bring Back the Book campaign? Because two years ago, the, the, the President of Nigeria started an initiative, Bring Back the Book. And so some people in the presidency were saying, oh, this sounds awfully a lot like Bring Back, bring back the Book. And then uh, some weeks before the, the whole thing went viral, Wally Shurinka had been addressing uh, a book club gathering in Port Harcourt, and he did a variation. The girls had just been taken into captivity, and he did a variation on bring back the book by saying, bring back the pupils. He said, bring back the pupils. So there was a branch of people saying, oh, you know, uh, the origin of this thing belongs to Wally Shurinka, the way of Good Luck Jonathan. And then, of course, uh, uh, Nigeria, a former minister in Nigeria and you know, very well-known activist who had been the vice president of the, of the World Bank, Obi uh, Zekwesi, also started something along Bring Back um, Our Girls. But that was after a lawyer in Abuja had also started. So you had all of a sudden, and then while all this was going on in Nigeria, one very smart, smart lady in California, you know, quickly jumps on board, claims it, changes her Wikipedia entry, and uh, LA Times, LA Times was later forced to withdraw it, LA Times put her on the front page, and before you know it, the Western media zoomed in, the American lady was the owner and the origin of Bring Back Our Girls. So, you know, there's contests over narrative, and ownership of the narrative of a problem, you know, that someone by a state in Nigeria and Africa. In the context of the politics, for there is always politics involved, of owning problems that are defined as African, it does seem to me that the advent of the hashtag and social media has introduced the dimension of separating the localized reality of problems from their modes of articulation, representation, and idea say, marketing. It seems to me that Africa is being told you may own the scrawny children with countable robes and mucus soaked nostrils studying under baobab trees with chalkboards donated by UNICEF. We reserve the right to adopt those malnourished children with full media fanfare and scold you if you grumble, even if you are the president of a country like Malawi. I hope you remember Madonna. I hope you remember Madonna asking the president of Malawi behave, you know? <laughs> you may own the lives and limbs being blown up in Kenya, in Congo, in Mali, and in the ungoverned Boko Haram territories of Nigeria. We own the glamour, glitz, and razzmatazz attendant upon the global dissemination and narrativization of those horrors. This leads me to a second set of questions that must detain, detain us as scholars and writers of Africa. You may have noticed that I have been using the passive voice when talking about African problems. In fact, I have avoided the specific phraseology employed by the conveners of the conference in South Africa. Instead, I have been talking about problems that are defined and narrativized as African. This mode of address is deliberate on my part. Apart from wondering whether Africa has the agency to own problems and their modes of articulation in the age of the hashtag, I have also been thinking lately about the necessity of problematizing the problem. I've been thinking that we need to ask more grand 
clearing questions about African problems before we go in search of the so-called African solutions. Perhaps my unease is further heightened by the suspicion that a certain neoliberal slate of the hand underwrites the expression African problems. I believe that the ability to smell neoliberal modes of framing, of naming, of engaging the actualities of Africa from a thousand miles must come with the territory of what we do as thinkers and writers of this continent. Hence, we must ask, what exactly are these African problems? How do problems come to acquire African citizenship? Who bears the naming? When is an African problem? For anybody familiar with the River Laundry List, these questions may appear to be no brainers. African problems? Oh, oh, oh. Poverty, illiteracy, disease, hunger, comatose infrastructure, tribalism, bad governance, wobbly democracy, and ally problems of leadership, crisis and conflict, corruption, environmental degradation. I'm surprised you're not adding to the list already. <laughs> The familiar tableau of human misery associated with the girl child, human trafficking, and above all, the failures of the post colonial state. Some would say her complete demission. This is by no means an exhaustive list of problems that have acquired African citizenship in global imaginaries of discourse. Each colleague in this room could draw up his or her own list, but I'm sure we would have considerable overlaps. Consider, for instance, Professor Joseph Kizabu's list and see how close is it to mine. Uh, quoting the eminent historian now, his own list of African problems, raging genocides, mass movement of refugees, tortures and mutilations, random destruction of the environment and biodiversity, hostage taking of the young generation as cannon fodder for warlords, the decimation of whole populations by pandemics, the stranglehold of the Republican army, the giving away and eradication of age-old cultures and distant knowledge. End quote. Professor Kizabo's list of the pressing challenges of the continent obviously devolves from the register of wars, conflict, and crisis. It is easy to, to run through the said list and think of Libya, Sudan, Somalia, Kenya, Nigeria, Mali, Congo, and all the ongoing, you know, uh, hotspots, the hotspots of, you know, ongoing crisis in the continent. If one wasn't in the mood for past specters of bloodletting in Rwanda, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. However, if you leave out any geographical reference, it is also quite possible for observers in other parts of the global south to run through this generic list of problems that has acquired the tag African and assume that one was describing those places and spaces. What is there in my own list, for instance, that is not part of the politics of everyday life in significant parts of Southeast, Southeast Asia, South and Central America, and the Arab world? Consider poverty. You'll be amazed by how comparable the indicators and the statistics are if you looked at, say, the situation in Peru, Honduras, Bangladesh, Ecuador, Papua New Guinea, Cambodia, the very black, deep south of the USA. Uh, I, I, I did an excursion and wrote about that in my book. I, 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 I thought I'd seen black, black poverty in, in Harlem, in Chicago, Southside, and, and some of the other regular places. On, in the summer of 2005, a friend told me, you ain't seen nothing yet. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's go down south. And, and took me through the very rural, deep, 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 deep down south. And um, I got to places that were like Sabongiri in Kano, even worse. And that was America. The First Nations reservations of Canada and Cameroon. Yet, only Africa becomes a synonym for these problems. 
The same applies to infrastructure. I've been reading that decrepit infrastructure is going to be one of the major headaches of the new Indian Prime Minister. The New York Times recently framed this problem, drawing on the capacity of Indians for self deprecating humor. Indians, the newspaper claims, have a saying that while the English drive on the left of the road, Indians drive on what's left of the road. Booker Prize winner and activist Arunda Tiro, he also paints a very great picture of poverty and infrastructure in India in a recent post-election interview. Yet, that part of the register of underdevelopment that deals with dilapidated infrastructure is also almost always framed as an African problem. These scenarios lead to some pressing questions. Do problems and human tragedies which also exist elsewhere become African because of perceived differences of spread and intensity? Do these problems become African because of imagined or real differences in the readiness of the institutions and opportunities of African modernity to rise up and solve them using critical human intelligence and innovation? Are these problems African because the websites of global actors and what I have previously theorized as the mercy industrial complex uh, almost always label them as African. And they, 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 in my book, the, the Mercy Industrial Complex, I throw a lot of actors into that basket, you know, um, donor agencies, humanitarian organizations, aid and charity organizations, uh, Bono, Jeffrey Sachs, uh, and career, career adopters of children like Madonna, you know. So I, 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 I do, I, I, I throw a lot into that basket. But I have more questions. Do these problems become African because the continent is powerless against the modes of rep representation so powerfully captured by Benya Vanga Wainaina in his classic piece, How to Write About Africa? And, and there's even a little variation of this problem uh, of discursive and epistemological violence. You know, there's, there's, there are two articles going around now about how to, how to design the cover of a book about Africa. You know, and it's, 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 it's moving in, in circuits of discourse in North America. You know, the, 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 I believe the, the Wall Street Journal and the New York Review of Books uh, have also, you know, it's, it's some, some journalists who studied the, 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 cover, the cover titles of hundreds of books written about Africa. You know, you want to make sure that uh, you've, you've got a baobab tree. You, 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 there, there's got to be some stuff going on. The acknowledgement by the organizers of the conference in Pretoria that culture has, because they wanted me to engage that theme from the perspective of culture, and we're getting there now, that culture has a role to play in finding African solutions for African problems is perhaps a conscious admission on their part that despite contemporary pressures to the contrary, history has a huge role to play in solving many of the said problems. To solve a problem is to understand it in all its manifestations and ramifications, and this includes its origins and modes of perpetuation. Yet, mentioning the colonial origin of many of the afflictions of the continent has become unfashionable in many of our disciplines. In my own discipline, it is taboo and could end you a citation by the essentialism police. As if Latin American thinkers like Annibal, Quijano, and Walter Miono never theorized coloniality, uh, roughly defined as the persistence in our present of the fault lines and effects of the colonial. We told that the recourse to colonial paradigms to explain the benumbing dilemmas of the African present amounts to disciplinary laziness and an attempt to excuse, rationalize, or justify the self-imposed rules and tragedies of contemporary Africa. Yet, how could Mahmoud Mandani have explained Rwanda without going back to the colonial origins of the problem? How can I explain Boko Haram? How can I propose solutions to Boko Haram without going back to 1914 in order to understand and map the errors 
of the rendering that have inevitably produced this gory Nigerian present. The search for more than 200 schoolgirls is only the latest stop in a journey program for tragedy and disaster by Lord Frederick Lugard in 1914. The Ibu genocide and the attendant civil war are also significant stops in that journey. To recall Chinua Achebe, how do you begin the process of drying yourself and you are told that it is no longer fashionable to try and understand when, where, and why the wind began to beat you? How do you solve a problem when you are told that the ordained discursive procedure now is to acknowledge and focus on your own contribution in making the rain that is beating you today and live well enough alone with regard to yesterday's rain made by foreign rainmakers. Do these two epistemological propositions have to be mutually exclusive? If history helps us to understand the origins and trajectory of many of the problems blighting the African present, Culture is what explains why the problems become, became African or why outsiders of the neoliberal bend have been able to attach a fixed African identity to problems that are transcendentally human, even where we make allowances for differences of intensity in Africa. Culture is the location of the original injury of modernity. Culture was the first target of the discourses and institutions of modernity at the moment of encounter. Many of the problems that Africa still has with the orders and institutions of modernity, democracy, governance, corruption, etc., devolve from the unresolved contradictions of the original injury of modernity. Let us not forget that modernity was imposed on the African largely through institutions of discipline and punish, uh, to borrow from Michel Foucault. The prison, the Christian mission, and the school did not stop at inflicting corporal punishment on the body of the native. While scrupulously pursuing the civilizing mission, they equally had very specific ideas about the cultures and worldviews of the African that we do not need to repeat here. If we need any reminder about this discipline and punish approach to the introduction of the structures of modernity in Africa, we need not look beyond the workings of the said institutions in Ferdinand Rumo's famous novel, Houseboy. Thus, the African was culturally alienated from the institutions, protocols, and orders of modernity from the very start. This cultural alienation explains in large part the apathy to institutions, especially public institutions in the continent. Institutions of modernity evolved as alienating structures of discipline and punish under colonialism and have retained that identity in the post-colonial phase of African life. The post-colonial state has failed woefully in detaching itself and its institutions from the colonial sources of violence that birthed it. Hence, corruption. Hence, the impunity with which the public treasury is plundered in so many African states, especially in my own Nigeria. As Kwame Geki reminds us in his book, Philosophy, Culture, and Vision, the cultural relationship of the African subject to its pre-colonial culture and political community conduced to a collective ownership of institutions and modes of cultural citizenship which enhanced the notion of the common good, the communal stream, communal farmlands, communal institutions of governance and public order were not just in sync with the psychic world of the African subject. You took care of them because they commanded your loyalty and were not structures of violence and alienation. Here then is the dilemma. Pre-colonial institutions worked with all their problems. It, it's not as if it was a perfect world uh, back then. Pre-colonial institutions worked and corruption was minimal and punished adequately whenever it occurred because those institutions were collectively owned. Post-colonial institutions, on the other hand, have trouble working or functioning properly in Africa because they are orphans. Everybody steals from them. Everybody leaves them to rot because nobody owns them. 
is the pre-colonial cultural attitudes of ownership of institutions and the, and the collective good were never carried over because the new institutions destroyed or looked down upon the cultural values and worldviews that would have aided their insertion into the African space and psyche. These are contradictions that the modern African state is here to resolve. She still hasn't been able to sell herself culturally to the African. The story is told, and this is a, a true story, listen to this very carefully, this is a true story, of the late Alihaji Borkin Zulu, a governor of Kano State in the north uh, during the Second Republic in Nigeria, which lasted from 1979 to 1983. The task of making the daily trip to the public treasury to steal money became too cumbersome for this governor. To solve the problem, he introduced the practice of home delivery of stolen public funds into the lexicon of corruption in, in Nigeria. Which means that, that that wasn't limited. Home delivery wasn't limited to the to the francophone francophone fathers of the nation, the Hufebuans of this world, who who had money delivered in kilos. You know, hey, the central bank governor bring me twenty kilos of hundred dollar bills. You know, <laughs> so that was the francophones. But this guy, this guy in Kano, also had his own approach. He simply had raw cash delivered to him in large quantities in his official residence, which we call government house in, in Nigeria. We call it the government house, government house. When the coup happened in 1983 and soldiers stormed government house to arrest him, they were astounded by the quantity of raw cash they found in his bedroom. When quoted, Berkiv Zulu famously replied, Government money in government house. What's the problem? <laughs> yeah. Government money in government house. That's the attitude to institutions. <laughs> Those post colonial institutions. Do you know? You know. This sums up the story of the African subjects' conceptualization of the institutions of the post colonial state. Would, would Al-Haji Berkin Zuru have had the same attitude to public office and to public property in the pre-colonial emirate of Kano? No. Who would not have done that? He had a totally different, he would have had a totally different mode of, of relating to that political structure, which was not carried over, because that was his. But now, these are institutions of modernity, it's they over there. Like corruption and institutions, most of the problems and challenges that post-colonial Africa has encountered in the arena of democracy and governance can be explained on the ground of our radical departure from the economic and political cultures of pre-colonial Africa. All over the continent today, the state and her economy are hyper-centralized because they were carried over or modified from the hyper-centralization of the political and economic structures of the colonial state. We are all familiar with the consequences of the hyper-centralization of political and economic power at the center all over the continent. It foreclosed the possibility of good governance and genuine democracy and facilitated the emergence of authoritarianism supervised by the big man and his cronies. You know, everybody is too busy that thing at the center. Because the big man's cronies are almost always from his ethnic neck of the woods, tribalism enters the picture as the handmaiden of political and economic hypercentralization. This has particularly been the case in much of Francophone Africa's post-colonial history, a period blooded by the father of the nation and his single party monolithism. Uh, monolithism. In, in fact, all the novels, all the novels of the 70s and the 80s in, in Francophone African literature, you know, all the writers, I mean, they were just producing dictatorship novels, you know, everybody from, from Henri Lopez to Alium Fontouré, Laboutancy, all, all of them, dictatorship novels. Uh, and I think Wally Shuyink at some point responded with a play of giants, you know, in, in Anglophone Africa. What sort of political and economic cultures did Africa evolve before the moment of colonial truncation? The, the case of the Igbo in eastern Nigeria is too well known to bear repeating here. 
Those of you who don't know the, the, the republicanism in real life have encountered it in the political life of the six villages making up Umwaru in Chino Achebe's Arrow of God. Gechi has also explored what he describes as consensual democracy among the Ashanti and other ethnic groups in pre-colonial Ghana. I will therefore illustrate this part of my submissions with the pre-colonial, political, and economic. I'm almost done. <laughs> oh, okay. I will therefore illustrate this part of my submissions with the pre-colonial, political, and economic um, cultures of my own people, uh, the Oko people in present Kogi State in central Nigeria. Oko land is made up of a number of major towns around which gravitated hamlets and villages. Some of the major towns include Kaba, Mapa, Egbe, and my own Isolu. Although the major traditional ruling stool was located in Isolu, all the satellite villages and hamlets also had their own stools which related in a traditional confederal fashion with the central stool in Isolu. Complementing this political confederacy was the fact that all the villages were economically autonomous and had their own independent markets and other economic structures. Colonialism destroyed this intricate, intricately decentralized political and economic culture and replaced it with the model with which we are all familiar. The post-colonial state completed this destruction of open political and economic confederacy. Today, Isolu and all the adjoining villages and hamlets now have to look up to the local government, centralized local government, which in turn looks up to the state government, and then everything comes from the center, from that, you know, Abuja. So the economic and political confederacy that they had, you know, everything has been, has been destroyed. And we still don't know, you know, all over the continent, we still don't know how to how to modernize that and bring it within the framework of the post-colonial state. And so you have um, the this, this shameful situation, you know, our search for solutions, you know, always northwards instead of what we have. Uh, one of the advantages of being a very public uh, African scholar in a, in, a, in a northern capital. One of the advantages I have, you know, based in Ottawa, is that um, uh, a lot happens about Africa in official Ottawa. You know, uh, African delegations are always, when they kick them out of, when, when they get tired of them in London and Washington, and they kick them out of London and Washington because that's where they go traditionally if they are from Anglophone Africa. That's where, that's where they go cap in hand. So when they kick them out of London and Washington, Ottawa is always the next delegation. So there are always African delegations coming to town. And folks like me always get invited by the Canadians. Hey, you know, we have a government delegation from Ghana. Hey, we have this from Nigeria, from Kenya. They are always coming to town. And uh, if you hear some of the reasons that these guys, you don't even pretend to put some dignity into this thing. You know, uh, th there was a time you had a bunch of 10 senators from Nigeria uh, in the constitutional review thing that they are doing. These guys come to Ottawa. And then as usual, the Canadians invite me, people are coming from, and then I go. What are they here to study? We are here to study uh, Canadian federalism. I said, are you guys kidding me? That's what we practiced in the era of the regions. That's what we had when we had the regions. The military destroyed it, you consolidated it, and then in the pickle, that's what we had in my village. You don't have to come to Canada to study it. Another time it was a delegation from this country, from Ghana. As usual, in fact, after the Ghanaian, I said, look, don't bring me to come and meet these Africans. The, <laughs> the reasons they are always coming to town. Some kind of delegation government, I don't know who sent them and what were they in town for this time around, to study how, how Canadians take care of the old. Oh, they put them in old people's home. You are going to go to Accra and put your father in an old people's home. So what are you here to do? What are you, what, what? You know, they dump them in old people's home. 
if the old lady is lucky, she gets she gets a, a greeting card in Easter and Thanksgiving. That's all. But the model is different in Africa. Here they grow up drinking Nakbete. She's surrounded by the... So wh wh why are you here to study? Wh wh what is the meaning of you want to study how they treat old people in Canada? Are you going to introduce that in Ghana? <laughs> Anyway, so so some of these things we have the we have those solutions here, but we're always running to the wrong places for answers. What needs to detain us here is the price that the continent continues to pay by stubbornly holding on to the machineries and institutions of political and economic centralization inherited from the colonial state instead of retracing her steps back to the pre-colonial cultural template in order to adapt, modify, and mod modernize it for contemporary usage. The first and perhaps most significant casualty of political and economic centralization is African innovation. The context for resources at the center has stunted African innovation because we have evolved a culture in which an entire nation is fixated on just that one source of prebendal patronage. And Prof, I'm sure you know what he has done to Nigeria. They destroyed agriculture and all the innovations that were going on there in the north. You know, the, the pyramids, the, the cotton, and everything. That, they destroyed everything, and everybody now is looking at, at the oil. You know. A rapacious political elite very often enlists the help of a confused intellectual class to think and theorize programs aimed at the consolidation of the current arrangement, which isn't working. For instance, Nigeria's um, erstwhile military dictator, General Ibrahim Babangida, was notorious for his generous use of university professors to theorize and legitimize his corrupt policies of over-centralization. Yet, so, you know, for a very long time, all our humanities and, um, and, and the arts were theorizing were, were Babangida's programs. Yet, recent developments in the continent point to the continued relevance of culture to any idea of renaissance and innovation. It is no longer a secret that Nigeria recently rebased her economy and announced her new status just two decades ago. In the 1980s and the 1990s, the party scene, the dance floor scene across this continent was dominated by American rap and R&B. On university campuses all over the continent, Michael Jackson, Janet Jackson, Mariah Carey, R. Kelly, 112, Next, Changing Faces, Joe, and Boys to Men reign supreme. I particularly liked rocking in the nightclubs to the tune of 112's Only You. Some of you may still remember that. You remember Only You? In the 1990s. You, I'm not asking you guys. You can't. You, <laughs> you, <laughs> yeah. Do not. Do we share this special thing called love? I know I do. What about you? Don't you remember that? I need you in my life. I, I, I can live without your love. Oh, do I do? Ah, yeah, you remember that? Ah, yeah. I'm the only one for you. Oh, I like to do. Only the only you. Okay. How about this next one? I'm sure you remember it. That's the African dance floor in the 80s, in the 90s. I belong to me. I belong to God. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, 80s, 90s, you know, great memories of those ancient times. Ancient for... <laughs> but today, there has been a cultural revolution on dance floors and party halls across Africa. Whether you are in Bella Roma nightclub, yeah. <laughs> I've been I've been there a couple of times <laughs> here in Accra. Uh, you know, some some of us were deconstructing this professorship thing. They call me the funky professor back in Carlton, so that the kids don't think that it's boring. You know, so <laughs> so yeah. Whether you're in Bella Roma nightclub here in Accra, or you are checking out Lagos, Nairobi, Kampala, Monrovia, or Kotono by night. The new cultural gospel in town, you know, across the continent is called Azonto, Skelewu, Eminado, and the latest, you know the latest? Dorobuchi. Dorobuchi. That's the very latest. That's what we're talking about right now. That's Dorobuchi. Now you can relate. So that's some taste of Dorobuchi. You can go and it's, it's the new. So these Anglophone African musical styles along with Francophone African offerings such as um, Coupe de Calais and Sagacité have checkmated American musical imperialism on the African dance floor. And this cultural revolution has had such a seismic consequence in the arena of political economy that Nigeria quite literally almost quite almost literally danced her way to the top spot as Africa's largest economy. You know, that's what has happened. You know, the stuff like this, Nollywood, IT and you 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 you, you capture an entire economic space. There are two lessons to be drawn from these scenarios. Culture is where Africa was written out of modernity. Culture is where her development, genius, and innovative spirit were discounted. Culture is where her path to self-recovery is located. Cultural innovation is where Nigeria came into its own as Africa's largest economy and also joined Mexico, Indonesia, and Turkey. Um, in the mint economies. Nigeria has no infrastructure fit even for the 19th century. She can hardly generate a week's supply of electricity and corruption is stratospheric. Yet cultural innovation intervened and saved Nigeria's behind when it mattered most. Secondly, you are nothing if you cannot even own and narrate your own problems. If you are a fringe player in the global theater of naming and ascription, those who name your problems for you will prescribe neoliberal solutions that fly in the face of your realities. As we have seen, the instruments for a global narrativizing of what constitutes African problems are cultural, social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you know, etc., etc. And of course, you have the print broadcasts like uh, the regular, the Economist, New York Times, and and the usual suspects. 
problems are essentially African and not human problems because global culture names them so. It is then only through a conscious rebasing of culture, that is a recreation and owning of culture in the 21st century that Africa will be able to identify, name, and engage her own problems on her own terms. Thank you. A very interesting lecture indeed. Thank you, Professor Adesami. Uh, before the chair takes up the question and answer time, I would like to acknowledge um, the Kwame Nkrumah Chair in African Studies, Professor Jacob Gordon. Can you show my hand? We also have on the high table the Deputy Director of the Institute of African Studies, Dr. Kwame Amwalabi. Now I'll hand over to Madam Che. We have the opportunity to make the man respond, uh, squirm if you like. I think we should also ask him to dance because I don't believe it's fair that you should, you know, tell us that you're a funky professor, play the music and then not dance. Okay, so floor is open for questions. Please raise your hand. We'll, t uh, we'll take about three, then let him respond, then we'll take another set. So, yes. Hello. Uh, thank you. My name is John Kamau, and I'm Kenyan, so I'm quite excited. And I'm also a friend on Facebook because I, I read your pieces and I was so excited and, and I added you. Now, um, uh, regarding your lecture, yes, I, I think my street credibility. Um, I, I, want, I, I still struggle with the, with, with, with the issues you raised. And, and if you look at every country, of course, every country is insecure about itself. If you go to Canada, of course, the Maritimes are complaining that they're losing their population to, to, to the metro, uh, to, to the MTVC region. If you go to China, they even ban people from going to certain regions. If you go to Belfast, but yet they are able to tell positive stories about themselves to the rest of the world and tell bad stories about the rest of the world to themselves, I guess, for them to boost their collective egos. But, but we are, we seem to be unable to do that. And not to attack your lecture, it seems even we Africans, we seem to tell negative stories about ourselves to ourselves. And, and so I think, do you think this psychic attack almost makes it impossible for us, especially the younger generation, to feel like there is nothing good about ourselves? Uh, not only we can, we can all contribute to ourselves, but to the rest of the world, and because of that, we are trapped in this negative narrative because the stories we tell ourselves, they are not necessarily predetermined by the Western media because if you want something horrible, all you have to do is not go to the New York Times, is open the daily graphic. So do, do we tell ourselves negative stories and the problems that we get are of our own making? And I'm not trying to blame Africa, but sorry, I, I, I'm struggling with that issue. No, thank you. Yeah, I saw a flurry of hands and they've kind of faded. Well, thank you very much for such an insightful lecture. And thank you for pushing the world till it breaks, <laughs> the boundary of knowledge. <laughs> My issue is the way forward. So how do we go on? Are we still uh, going to carry this armor of who owns the problem? Are we owning it, or is somebody owning it? <laughs> so what's the way forward? Okay. There are two, let's take those two, and then we'll get um, off to respond, and we'll do another round. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Prince, and uh, first of all, let me thank you so much for the insight. Uh, I just want to find out, uh, I mean, who owns the problem? How does a problem come to? gain the status of an uh, African sort of identity. Uh, I want to know, does our inability to solve most of the problems of Africa emanate from how we see the problems in terms of I mean, how we uh, perceive those problems and then how we even name or label I mean, those challenges? Yeah, thank you very much. My name is um, Ebenezer. 
last two years I was in Nigeria for a film shoot and um, almost everyone would say Ghana is good, Nigeria is corrupt. Then there was one pastor who said if all Nigerians would stop saying Nigeria is corrupt, then Nigeria will not be corrupt. What do you think of that? I'll give you a simple, I'll start with question number two. I'll give you a simple instance sometimes of how framing, how you narrate, how you perceive a problem can cloud and affect even the will to solve it, you know. Take something as simple as as um, Boko Haram. Of course, you know it's it, it's got it's a multi-dimensional problem, but it was coming from somewhere, and there are points at which one could be led <coughs> led to believe that it was containable that it was containable. But the moment it was framed by somebody somewhere as, well, these are northerners killing northerners to somehow make me look incompetent. That clouded a lot of things. That clouded a lot of things in terms of how the problem has been approached, solved, or not solved. If you look at, um, again, if you look at um, some of the approaches that were taken to even the restiveness in the Niger Delta, in the Niger Delta, when they had militancy, kidnappings, and what have you, before the amnesty. You know how many villages were leveled from the 1990s? You know how many villages were literally leveled? You know, when starting with Babangida, who leveled uh, Umuechem, an entire village. You know, he sent the Air Force and leveled it an entire village to Age to I think I think Age was under no no to Odi and uh, which which was the second one after Odi there were Odi and um, some other village there leveled by Obasanjo then uh, uh, then Age was leveled by by Yaradua Yaradua actually also leveled a village before he saw that leveling villages with the air force would not work and he backed down and started to. Why were some people in that establishment so comfortable with sending the Nigerian Air Force to bomb entire villages in the country? Why were they so comfortable? Again, because of framing. Framing a particular problem as, oh, you know, these people from the South South, you know, framing it along ethnic and even, you know, they are out to destroy my government. So, how you frame and narrate a problem can have I mean, concrete consequences in terms of whether you are going to muster the political will that is necessary to solve in it. You know, that happens. Uh, uh, across, across region and islands in Africa, you know, how some of these problems are framed for you. Do you know that what happened, what, what happened when, um, or some of the discoveries that are being made after Paul B and Jonathan had been summoned to Paris three weeks ago, three weeks ago to, to, uh, to discuss Boko Haram, you know, because Boko Haram has been ravaging northern Cameroon. They've been making incursions. They've been they've been kidnapping. Three weeks ago, they kidnapped um, they kidnapped some Chinese and their workers, and they, they've been killing. They've been destroying. 
it's not localized in Nigeria. They've been in Cameroon, you know, for 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 at least the past five years. They've been making incursions into Cameroon. Nigeria was solving it as a Nigerian problem, framing it along lines, you know, the iron curtain of language and ide ideology. Cameroon was was doing it until the last attack, which then involved uh, Chinese interests. Now, because it involves Chinese interests, the Chinese who are going to, to, and anything that involves another foreign power moving in anywhere in Francophone Africa, you know France will not like it and will not accept it. So the, the, the president of France convenes all of a sudden, out of the blue, a Nigeria security meeting in Paris and summons uh, Good Luck Jonathan and five, some, five other presidents in, in Francophone Africa. I was very, very unhappy with, with, with with that, by the way. But then when they get got there, it turned out that the last time Paul B. and Jonathan spoke was in 2011. It was in 2011. So it now needed the president of France to okay these two African fools. Now you can talk. Go back to go back and talk. We, we, are, we are permitting it. And now it's no longer, this problem is no longer Anglophone, Francophone. You can muster a common, it had to be authorized in France. So, how you view a problem, if they had viewed it as a common African regional problem between the two of them, they would have been talking since 2011. They might have come up with a bilateral framework or some kind of mechanism. They might have revived something in echo. You know, the two of them, two of them acting together, but no, oh, is this Anglophones or oh, is this Francophones? And you see it too, even in academia, you know, everywhere I go in conferences, I tell people, uh, somebody like me, when, when I go to the ASE or the ALA, you see the Anglophones and Frank, they are oil and water. You see the Anglophones somewhere, the Francophones somewhere, and they don't mix. And somebody like me, I have to be going constantly in between the two and wondering who is treating me like a traitor. <laughs> mix. So, you know, who knows where Boko Haram, how far some kind of collaboration between Cameroon and uh, would have gone in terms of the political will of two presidents if they had not framed, perceived, or narrated that problem as Anglophone or Francophone. Now, it, it took the president of France to break that down. So, yeah, it does have concrete consequences. The perception of a problem can have concrete consequences in terms of your, of your willingness to even muster that political willpower to engage it and to, to engage it appropriately. Um, yeah, I, I, in fact, when you were asking your question, I, I sort of thought that um, we're thinking along the same lines. We're thinking along the same lines. Yeah, there is too much circulation and recirculation. Oh, your, your countryman says that uh, underneath the burden of all that negativity, uh, Bia. Bia says it is even difficult to imagine newness now. How do you come up with newness when all the symbologies around you, everything that's thrown at you, you know, it's negative, 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 you know. And that's why I'm saying the stories of innovation, we can go back to them and tell them. You know, <laughs> Ushahidi, which came out of your country, where is the story? Where is the story? Where is it? Who is telling it? But that's that's one fantastic instance, you know, of innovation. Just just to go there. So yeah, those 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 um. But it also comes down to the problem of how do you own the memes? How do you uh, to tell your own stories? To focus on the positive stories and all that, and. In this day and age, 
I am saying that we don't have the excuse anymore of saying that we don't have the means that it's it's all through CNN and the regular because you've got social media and it's a very 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 powerful tool right it's a very 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 powerful tool yeah so there's been there's been um, uh, uh, there's been five centuries of this kinds of narrative and then at some point there has been also our own complicity you know in terms of the projection of 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 those kinds of stories but i think we also must be careful that in attempting to tell positive stories, you know, what we have contributed, what we have done, that we don't pretend that we don't have problems because that's not what one is saying. What one is saying is that these problems must not be pathologized, they must not be essentialized, you know, they are, the intensity here doesn't mean that uh, they are all that define us and that is what that is the level at which our resistance must be even as we try to muster the willpower to face these problems on our own on our own terms because trust me every time you want to the the the, the reality of forces ranged against the emergence of your own stories of your own of your own narrative it's very real there was a time when folks gathered in Lagos. Folks gathered in Lagos and came up with this excellent thing they called the, the Lagos Plan of Action. You remember? They came up with this excellent thing, the Lagos Plan of Action, which was to be some kind of economic, uh, socio-economic and political blueprint for Africa. This was a gathering, it was almost a mini OE, and they were, I mean, it took years of preparation by all kinds of um, uh, political actors and economic actors within the member states of the OE, and they eventually met in Lagos, this was in the 80s, and they said, we have the Lagos plan of, of action. The moment that initiative was launched, the, the Lagos plan of action, what emerged? What emerged? Fun? Yeah, and then gradually we moved towards SAP. We moved towards SAP. And those countries were literally cudgeled and hammered into abandoning. The Lagos Plan of Action was a very positive narrative. It came complete, it was a complete, go back to it and read it. Brilliant document, complete with the own mechanisms of narrative, very positive and forward looking. Sap, 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 sap. And it, it wasn't until Joseph Stiglitz, because everybody kept ramming down, <coughs> ramming this sap down everybody's throat, and we all know the narrative of sap. It wasn't until Joseph Stiglitz who had the courage. Because all, all the Africans, you know, who are fighting SAP, we know what happened to them, whether they were intellectuals and all that, you know, who was going to listen to them? But Stiglitz from the World Bank then came and said, even without applying this thing today, it is bad economics. Even without looking at its application in Africa, it is bad economics. Intrinsically poor economics. And then the moment... For all its for all its problems of idealism and all that, this African Renaissance thing that uh, the South Africans started and all that, and we're beginning to try to use it as a basis for some kind of bringing us back into the framework of a positive narrative, positive aspirations. African Renaissance comes. What came to counter it? What came to counter it? No. Africa rising. There's this discourse of Africa rising. So every time you have an initiative, something comes from the global north. So this discourse of Africa rising, it's everywhere. The, from the economies to even Fox News sometimes notices that Africa is rising. 
which is dangerous if Fox News says that Africa is rising. That's very dangerous. Extremely dangerous. So suddenly everybody, oh, Africa rising, Africa this, Africa that. Every time you see Richard Quest, very animated, jumping up and Africa rising and all that. Who is saying that Africa is rising and why? And what do they mean? When I say Africa rising, it is different from what those guys are saying. They are saying it's, it's rich pickings. It's rich pickings. Move in. SAP already did the, 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 the groundwork for the day. So again, so these things, it's, it's not that it's not real, that every attempt, you know, at some kind of positive initiative, positive innovation, you know, positive narrativization, you know, so that's, that's, the, that's the challenge, that's the challenge we face. You know, and it's it's you and I are, are, are aware of these of these things, but where we have a real problem is how to sell those nuances and those dangers to to these guys. Because if we don't sell these stories properly to these guys, we lose them to another potential source of, um, I, I don't know whether to call it danger, you know, I don't know whether to call it danger because I've been writing and talking about that, you know, if you don't, uh, then they end up on the, on the pitch opposite my house, they end up on the pitch opposite my house, aspiring to become billionaires by praying and expecting miracles. So we have to be very careful. So we lose them to the prosperity, the prosperity Pentecostal merchants of hope. And then we lose their ability to innovate critically because everything will then come from that paradigm. So we have to be very careful. So these are some of the, the issues. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the, of, of, of the danger that you are, that you are talking about. Um, Yeah, the way forward. I I I I I I I put I put out one 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 or two or two ways forward. I you know in terms of at least the concrete problems that I that I that I identified. How do we begin? Uh, how do we begin? You know, when, when I talked about the attitudes to institutions, they are alien. They are obviously you need. A re-engineering of the African psyche. You need, and it's not an easy task. It involves it because it, that is where it leads to corruption. It leads to we don't. I, I believe part of what we are trying to do in having that course in institutions, institutions, because we don't even know what institutions are in this in this continent. We don't. We just say people don't even. They don't even understand. They, they don't even, you know, one minute, you know, you follow me on Facebook, one minute the, 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 the presidency is issuing one statement about maybe the, the number of missing girls. The next minute somebody says, ah, we don't actually know. About five different people speaking from five different points of their mouth in the same presidency. We said, no, you know, the presidency is an institution. There, there is something called institutional integrity. You know, it's like you people, you, you don't even, if the military, every, at every level, and it's everywhere you go in this continent, people have, they don't know jack about institutions. And so they don't just care because, like I said, they are alienated, it's they. Less than 2%, those who care about institutions across the continent are those who are benefiting directly from those institutions and eating and all that. Yeah, again, all, the, all, the, all of us, the rest of us is like, oh, okay, those of them, over the, we have the Burkins attitude to it because we are outside of it. So how do we re-engineer? So it starts, it starts, it starts with the universities. 
it starts with the university, it starts with the, you know, education, civics, so it's, it's all interlinked in order to change attitudes and have, and have, and have. But then again, of course, the bad news is that, you know, across the continent, what kind of power do these universities even have? Even have to to critically map their own way and challenge existing neoliberal. We, we, when you start seeing vision vision documents uh, that are de-emphasizing, you know, in Nigeria we have stopped teaching history, and the politicians are celebrating. They are they are actually, you know, they are actually celebrating it. You know, it's like ah, you know, we we're done with it. We're done with it, which means our ability to even teach this generation where things are coming from in order to show them where we are going is severely is, is severely crippled. And the universities, you go across the continent and you, you see all kinds of, of funny mission statements and vision statements, and, and, and you know that these statements are coming from, 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 from the World Bank or the IMF and all. You know, you know, you, you read between the lines and you know who is dictating this statements because they are funding these universities. So we have these problems. Now your hands are up. Okay. Sh short and sweet so that all of you, and you are allowed to make him squirm like uh, Mr. Kamau did. Definitely. Okay, uh, my question is, do you, is the African problem a problem because we are measuring it by global standards and Africa lags behind? Or do Africans call the situations that prevail problems because they measure it by Western um, standards and they don't measure up? For example, Boko Haram, um, minus the terrorism approach, which is obviously a negative aspect. Are they a problem because they are trying to abolish Western education, which is globally acclaimed? Or can we be confident as Africans that whatever substitute they provide is um, a good equivalent? I wanted to ask, in terms of the outside influence, there no country that I know of that has no foreign influence whatsoever, apart from probably North Korea, and I don't know how that's working out for them. But can... And it, can a country survive solely on its own? And I know you're, we're not saying that, but in terms of our problem, once it's identified and once it's claimed as our problem and not the West problem, where exactly do we come, where do you find the crossroads where we say goodbye to foreign influence and take it upon ourselves? Because as you mentioned, um, the pre-colonial, um, post, is it pre-colonial states? post-colonial states, yes, um, a sort of an embarrassing state right now as it is because we let go of foreign implements. But where do we let go and when is it like the right time? Um, okay, so most people, like from what I've read so far, like Lots of people find the problems. So in Africa, for example, the Boko Haram situation, I know everyone is using this, but anyways. So for them, people knew what the problem was, but then because the government wasn't um, acting, they decided to find help from outside because they thought that was the only way. So how, like, it's possible that Africans can identify their own problems, but then how do we give them faith that they can solve the problems? Because it seems that they feel as though maybe like, we're not good enough, so then there's no way we can change. Yeah, and we have to ask for help. So how is it that we can make ourselves believe that we can solve the problems? That I've been attending, a lot of people have been saying that the torch is being passed on to us now, our generation. And our previous generation has admitted that they have failed us, Africa in general. So what do you believe has been done drastically different with our generation that's going to make us succeed in solving the problems of Africa? So uh, my question is basically 
what uh, what are the importance of such meetings? In case, like, I've seen a lot of meetings about African issues and African problems. So, like, if I pick any of the students here, they can mention a lot of problems about Africa. But the problem is, like, who's going to act? Like, we spend too much time talking about our problems, but... Like right now, I'm sure there are a lot of countries discussing about our problems and those issues. And then how are we sure, if we are going to say this generation is going to act, how are we sure these students will join politics? Or they might end up being a lecture teaching about African problems, these same students. So what are basically, how are we going to act or who is going to act? Uh, when we talk of terrorism, governance, and uh, the basic social problems that we have, uh, well, from your submission, I just want to find out if it is self-undermining or perhaps questionable to resort to countries who have been comparatively successful in dealing with some of these problems. I mean, what is, what is wrong if Ghana or Nigeria travels all the way to Canada who have been very uh, successful in dealing with, I mean, uh, problems? affecting older people and uh, other you know other problems to resort or to dialogue with them and find out solutions that uh, they can adapt to our context and then make it more, more successful and deal with our problems thank you okay mike move forward and then we'll take responses do you think that the west is so in, um, um, interested in our problems because uh leaders are taking a laissez-faire attitude towards them. For example, I read the, the first time Good Luck Jonathan visited the village where the girls were abducted from was on his way to the airport to go to Paris. So he hasn't even visited. So is it, do you think the West is so interested because they feel as though our leaders are being a bit too laissez-faire and, you know, unconcerned and... Do I so good? Good luck. He, he hasn't he hasn't visited yet. You know he, he he hasn't gone gone there yet. Yeah. So why why the West is interested in those problems? Do I think it's 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 because of um of what? Do I think it's because? Ah uh, well. I would, I would go with that um, logic if um, I had any evidence of um, similar interests in 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 the problems of less resourced African countries. You know, if if if. Uh, uh, if all the countries got to sell, <laughs> if you're selling bananas, you know, if all you have, you're, banana, you're selling bananas and then you have problems of, um, you have problems of um, insurgency and, and, and whatever, and then I see a lot of interest, then I'd say, okay, maybe that would wash. But the problem is the pattern, the pattern of where these interests always appear. You know, if the interest is not appearing in Angola, it's appearing in Nigeria, it's appearing in uh, Sierra Leone, it's appearing, so it's appearing in the Congo and all that. So it just so happens that wherever this interest appears, then then you've you've either got diamonds or you've got coltan or you've got uh, or you've got a lot of oil, you know. Uh, in fact, I was answering a question similar to this last week. And I, I said that um, at the beginning of the, of the militancy period in, in the Niger Delta, the, the targets, the initial targets of kidnappings, kidnappings when, we, when, we, when the kidnapping started, were Western expatriates. You know, the, the main people were targeting only Western, only white people, only Western expatriates working for Shell, Chevron, and allied companies all over the Niger Delta. You just had to be white, and you would be taken. 
at the at the beginning, of course, it later snowballed into something else, and they started picking everybody, including people like us. <laughs> once once you come home from from Europe or North America, it didn't matter whether you were Nigerian, black or white, you know. But the very early stage of this thing, they were kidnapping only white, you know, expatriates, you know, working in the oil companies. And so I was always very surprised. Whenever I was coming back home, you know, you got to, to, to London, to Frankfurt, or to Amsterdam, to join the flight to Lagos. And almost 90% of the passengers on this plane would be white expatriates going to the Niger Delta. I said, oh boy, they are kidnapping these people now. Why are they still going? What are they going to fight? So again, this this oil business, you know, how come you still got plane loads, you know, going to where they're being picked up? So the interest, who knows? So, so I don't, uh, I don't think it's linked to any perception that, again, like I said, Boko Haram has been disturbing the Cameroons for a very long time. It didn't just start, and it's not that the the, the French only just noticed that 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 the, the incursions have been going on there, you know. But but the moment it looked like some other powers may be interested because. Again, they are citizens. You, you certainly, it's it's bad enough from where you, you know folks are very nervous about China's China's about China in Africa. Your folks are very very nervous. You know, there is there is there is a, 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 an entire Western narrative about it. You know, uh, which is very negative because it reflects the anxiety. It is a major competitor who has moved in and is just going all over the place. So I believe that what drove that interest uh, of France in in this in this matter uh, was the prospect of the Chinese moving in beyond what they are already doing. Because now this Boko Haram was going to become China's problem. How many Chinese people did they? You know, almost a dozen, almost a dozen Chinese expatriates and all that. Now that it was only after the Chinese had been taken and with Beijing start starting to make some kind of statements that France moved in uh, and, and and got interested really in in, in in a meeting between Nigeria and and her francophone neighbor. You know, um, the I'm not sure I got this one right. The the gentleman behind there, I'm, I'm very happy about your question. You know, the seeming distance between talk and action. You know, it's the age-old worrying about the distance between the theory and practice or praxis or, 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 or what you call it. Uh, there is no such thing as too much talking or talk about, about a problem. Let me give you an example. It's it, maybe it doesn't feel like they did too much talking now because they didn't have some of the the uh, the outlets that we have. Uh, out of these kinds of talkings and meetings and brainstorming and 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 whatever you call it. All the actions and ideologies that give birth to your freedom, led by folks like Kwame Nkrumah, came out of talkings and meetings and conferences and rubbing of minds and all that. You know, because you know that's where you produce thought. And that's where you cross-check your intellection. You meet, so they met everywhere. That the nationalist generation, you know, uh, they didn't even just talk in Africa. You know, they talked with the diaspora. They met with them. They went everywhere. So uh, there's no such thing as, and and people try to make that because they don't always see the connection. You know, you talk, you act, you talk, you. Act. So they, they they both go hand in hand. You cannot separate them. You know, you cannot separate Pan Africanism from uh, the talking and the rubbing of minds. 
that produced it. You, you, you cannot separate negritude from the talking and the rubbing of minds, you know, uh, that produced it. They met everywhere from Paris to Rome to the, to the, to the, to the capitals of the continent. So it's not, we're not doing, doing anything new, but I'm, I'm, Aware though that yes, there is that danger that um, we sometimes could get carried away if these talks don't appear to lead to concrete steps in terms of where are we going, what are the next steps, how do we, uh, how do we move on to action and all that. So that, that danger is always there. But I believe that it's lesser than the danger of an unreflected society of an unthought society and uh, when when we think when we reflect you you can't just do that in your own head i got to sit down in in fora such as this we rob minds we you you know you know that thing you're saying doesn't quite make sense this makes sense and that's how we enrich the discourse so it's 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 got to happen so i don't necessarily subscribe to this view that uh one happens at the expense of the other or if one happens it doesn't feed or enhance the other um there was a question about the willpower to share uh, if if we can even solve these problems, I, I, I don't know. I wrote it down poorly, but I have the I have the answer. Yeah, don't blame me. Nobody writes anymore. If I was texting it, it would have come. <laughs> It would have come out better than than, than my handwriting. <laughs> yeah, I, I believe the question about whether we whether the you know I don't know where I don't know where I got got willpower willpower here. Are, are problems Africans because they are ah exactly exactly yeah you had you had two two angles to that question the Boko Haram question the first angle great the second angle uh uh there is nothing that Boko Haram is proposing. That 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 is worth that is even worth looking at as an alternative. There is there is there is nothing that they are talking about. These are absolutely murderous. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. They are in fact they have changed the music so many times that it's even difficult to pinpoint but the bottom line of of what they want is a strict um sharia islamic republic uh but the, the content of their own understanding and interpretation of what an islamic or sharia republic is we, we're not even talking iran here we, we, it, 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 it's it's beyond any known model it's 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 not it's not i mean the the cutting off of of jangedi's hands because when this 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 idiot in 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 Zamfara introduced and 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 wanted to use it, it was a political move to subvert the, the, the government of the day. He was stealing millions, literally millions. But then this guy steals a goat. This poor man steals a goat, and then you go and and, and cut off his hand. And say you are. That was the first act of political Sharia in that part of Nigeria. And then you got the Boko Haram guys saying that that's even the, 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 a laughably light sentence. 
it's 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 not even good enough a sentence so if you are not stoning like they wanted to do to so what we so, so those who wanted to stone amina mama those who are amina lawal sorry amina mama is a, <laughs> those who wanted to stone amina lawal those who want those who cut off uh Jangedi's hands uh, those are the the the, the 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 those are in the moderate fringe of the Sharia movement. Boko Haram even looks down on people like that. So there's nothing Boko Haram is proposing that is even you know uh, because uh, when they say this Western education or Western civilization thing that they are rejecting that is it's a it's a shorthand for they, they throw everything it's a shorthand for even the islamic before rejecting even the islamic the islamic civilizations that you uh, the islamic modernities that you have in places like the uae like uh, you know when you travel in those places and you see you see the hyper modern that's been imagined and built by muslims like them and all that that's 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 also haram that's also haram so there is nothing there they are they are they are proposing that's a good alternative to uh, uh, and and that's why it's so difficult to negotiate with but what are you going to what are you going to when they are saying that the minimum is that the whole of that country must convert to their own perverse or not even to islam but to their own perverse understanding and interpretation of islam which is which is all the which is all they they want i still wish i understood this last question that i that i but i'm i'm sorry i didn't quite yeah was it yours handing handing the torch to the next generation right uh yeah how many events you're saying that um, the torch is being handed to our generation and unfortunately our previous generation have admitted that they have failed us or Africa so what do you think has been done so drastically different with our generation that is going to make us succeed in solving these problems that Africa has hmm. that's 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 a question for people like director here <laughs> And and some and some of the people sitting here, they, they should be answering that 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 um, that question. What have you been doing? And <laughs> and deputy director eh, eh, Moses, eh, 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 do you think my God there exactly? What have you been doing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, to, to, to empower uh, to empower what has been come, let's let's think about this thing seriously what 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 have we outside outside of the regular outside of the regular outside of the regular hmm, this is a very difficult question though this is a very difficult question what have been doing different uh, director we answer what you have been doing uh, uh, differently you know differently but um actually did the, 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 the generation before you did they admit to failure did they say that they failed no i i know i know what Inka said um wasted generation not failed generation he said it was wasted but i'll see if director agrees that's my way to dodge it <laughs> Thank you very much, Pius. I think we should give all of us ourselves a big hand. I know that we've spent um, a bit of time here and we've engaged. It has been interesting. We've shared minds and that is certainly one of the things that we need to do as we move the generations uh, forward. And particularly for the sake of our younger ones, I'd just like to make a couple of comments and then we will bring the curtain down on um, this evening's events. My understanding of what um, Professor Adesami has shared with us is and he has said many things, 
but for us to take away with us the importance of naming and framing. The way things are named and the way they are framed and who does the naming and framing is critically important. So we can decide to name and frame and own it and to resist the naming and framing that others put on us or we can decide to go with the flow and it might not be what is comfortable for us. And perhaps many of the things that have been said this evening are uncomfortable but discomfort is good because if we don't get uncomfortable, we become complacent. And asking questions is good. And the sense of frustration that I hear, particularly with our high school students, is also good. Because if you are not frustrated, you will become comfortable in where you are. And then you will join those who don't care about the naming and framing and, the prob and become a part of the problem. By way, or I'm, and I'm not sure that I will concede that our generation has failed. Maybe my parents' generation did very well, and we have not done quite so well, but I'm not sure that we have failed. Because we've also nurtured some young people who are doing well, and there are many young people in this country and across Africa who are doing well. You mentioned Ushahidi, the, the phenomenon in Kenya that has become a te technological tool that has not only alerted people about um, violence in Kenya, but has been used across the globe. It has been used in North America during snowstorms to alert people to what was going on. Was it named? Did Kenyan youth get the credit for developing that technology? It's been used in the Gaza. So we need to make noise about the things that we do. And now we've got social media, so it's an opportunity for us to shout about the things that we are doing. I suppose that uh, those of us in the academy and and Scholars in Africa do not have the luxury of being purely scholars. Many of us are also activists. We teach an undergraduate course in this university called Introduction to African Studies. And one of the questions that we sometimes ask is, if we change the indicators around, might we have a different map of problems? If we decided to measure, for example, rates of rape, if we decided to use rates of drug abuse, suicides, college shootings, will we have a different map of problems? If we decided to use a happiness index, Nigeria would be at the top of the list. If we decided to use dance moves and popular culture, Africa and South America would be way up there. Some people have decided that these are the indicators that we will use. HIV AIDS rates, okay. Poverty, okay. But when we are doing poverty, we do it per capita. We don't do a map and show the deep south and how there are poor people there and that they are poor because they are black and that there's racism. So it is up to us to do the naming, the framing, the owning. And I think that this is an important contribution we make when we do intellectual discourse. Talking is important. Reflecting, as our speaker has told us, is important. Knowing the knowledge systems are important. And one of the things that Professor Adesami has been doing while he was here, he came principally to be with us and uh, other people have poached. But we've developed a whole new set of courses on African thought. These are graduate courses. But there are many things that even those of us as senior scholars were not aware of. And so as we look at courses on contemporary issues in African thought, particular African thinkers, women who have contributed to African thought and to innovations, we have to develop our own narrative. We have to tell our own stories. We had a speaker here last year who reminded us that the stories have to be innovated, if there is such a word. We have to keep creating them. Don't we don't take out our culture. Okay, there's a funeral or there's an outdooring, so we'll take out our culture and the funeral is over and we put our culture back in our rooms. Our culture is dynamic and we need to keep on making it new because too often our culture has been set up as the problem. We are not developing because of our culture. But what is culture? It sounds as if other people don't have cultures. There's an African problem and an African culture. 
But there's an American problem, and there's an Asian problem, there's a European problem, and they also have cultures. And those cultures are, are linked to suicide rates and college shootings. That's a culture of shooting. But it is not named as an American culture. But when we shoot here, it is an African problem and an African culture. It is how it is named and framed. And we must resist those namings and framings and own our problems and decide how we will deal with them. Of course, we will call for help. But we need to decide how they will look like. Not other people to tell us that these are problems. So on that note, I would like to thank our speaker very, very much. We've had um, an exciting year with him, and we would like to give him something. This will not be the last thing that we will give him, but we would like to give him something um, this evening to show our gratitude for having made us think a little bit harder uh, this year by posing difficult questions to us, making us uncomfortable and pushing us to look into the knowledge that is there and to make it available for us to share with our students. So Pius, we are very grateful. As you know, this is not, you are not leaving the University of Ghana. You have already been threatened with future trips. So thank you very much for being with us. God bless you.